world is happening on Wall Street. Economic indicators. Who knows where this is going to end up? To understand the economy, you have to understand human nature. How are you doing there? It is David. It is the podcast. You know the drill. We're trying to make economics that little bit more comprehensible, that little bit more relevant, and hopefully a little bit more digestible. Now, I am in New York. John is in Dublin. JM is in Dublin. So if there's any distortion on the mics, it's my fault. I've been in New York for the last uh, day or two. I lost my bags. It was a strange couple of days coming from Toronto, but I'll tell you all about that. But let's have a gander and talk to the lads. What's the crack head? All good? Divil a bit now. It's all good. <laughs> you got your bags eventually, did you? Yeah, I was I was a little bit minging now, in fairness. I, I see uh, you were. Yeah, I no, it was a shocking were. thing. I also had that, you know, that horrible moment where you realise you are the gobshite in reception shouting at somebody about your bags and that person has no idea what you're talking about. Do you know who I am? More like, it wasn't that bad, but it was, I just, I came up to the room and thought, oh man, that is such a horrible look. That is a horrible look. Uh, but you know, that's kind of like you're jet lagged. And mac- anyway, long and the short of it is, bags are here. All is good. New York is Excellent. New York, John. It is, ex- I mean, the city, I, I, every time I come here, I still am excited by the place. They're obviously in massive coronavirus lockdown now. And the Yanks being the Yanks are doing this in huge style, even though I believe there's only one case in the United States. But are they freaking out? Completely freaking out. The whole they're all going around with masks, the whole usual carry on. It's it's, it's America. Ah yeah. But what's the crack at home? All good? All good, yeah. In in the midst of a massive storm, Storm Jorge is ripping up the place here. I'm batting down all the hatches and we're all good, apart from that. Well, let's let's kick off. Uh, let's talk coronavirus. We are delighted to have a real expert on the line, Luke O'Neill. Luke O'Neill is Professor of Immunology at Trinity, all around good egg. If you're interested in science being accessible, he has a beautiful, beautiful book called Humanology, published maybe two years ago. Wonderful, wonderful, wonderful read. Luke, what's the crack? How are you, man? Not too bad, David. Doing well. No virus in me yet, I hope. Good, good. Okay, Luke, tell me about the medicine. Tell me about this virus. What's your sense? Where is it going to go? How bad is it? Talk to me. Sure. Well, it's all over the news, as you know, David, all the media constantly. There's a big fear, isn't there, which we've all seen, I suppose. And it is, it is serious enough, remember, because it's a brand new virus, never seen before. That's the first thing. And now, mind you, us scientists, we love that because we can study it and try to figure out where it came from and stuff. So because it's brand new, people worry. And of course, there are people dying, remember. You know, it's about a 3% mortality rate at the moment. The good, the good part is we, we can study all these Chinese people, you know, thousands and thousands of them, and have a good feel for where it's going to go. So first of all, 3% mortality. But remember, 80% get over it. And that's the other thing that we must keep re-emphasizing. And about 14% then might have some kind of illness and might need to be looked after. So, you know, it's a concern, obviously, because it's brand new. But the big, the big question is, are people overreacting and, you know, shelves emptying? of hand sanitizers and all this kind of thing. And, uh, you know, the current view is that might be slightly over the top, I guess. But, what, OK, let's let's look at the science of it. Where did the virus come from? How did it mutate? What is it? Yeah, it, it's a coronavirus. So there's seven of them in the family. It's, a, it's the newest kid in the block, if you like. There were six before, and now there's seven. And the one we remember is SARS, as you may remember, 2003. That was the previous family member that caused problems. Um, and it came from bats, they think, in this... Um, seafood market in Wuhan in China, it jumped out of the bat into a human and it's getting detected as a kind of a flu illness. And of course, the symptoms are just like the flu. In December, people are being in the hospital there with some fever and so on. And they realize, hang on a minute, this is a new virus that begins. And so it's a brand new one. And as I say, that makes us slightly more concerned because there'd be no immunity then, you know, because when a new virus crops up, there's nobody that can defend themselves. And that's not another thing to watch. So brand new. And, and then the big question is what happens next? The Chinese were pretty quick, though. They did lock the place down, as you may remember, and did a great job, really. You know, it looks like WHO have given them credit for how quick they responded. With SARS, they're a bit slower. And then it spread a bit more quickly and, and ended up in places like Toronto, where people died, you know. so But this time, the Chinese managed to, to, to control it. However, it's more contagious than SARS. So it's spreading a bit more than, than SARS did. And the WHO last night up, up the level of warning to a high status. It's in every continent now, David. The last continent that doesn't have it is Antarctica, they said in their, their website. You know, so, so it is spreading around the world, is, is a concern. 
And explain to me the path of pandemics. What actually is the path of pandemics? Yeah, so this this one is tricky because it's respiratory. So you cough it up, you sneeze, and then the person beside you, if you're within two meters of someone actually who's coughing and sneezing, you're at risk of uh, of catching it. And of course, the, the stuff can land on surfaces, the spit you know, can land on, on top of the table or on various surfaces. And again, you can, you can touch that and then raise your hand to your face and then you catch it that way. That means it spreads reasonably readily. At the moment, uh, one person would infect two to three people on average, you see, and then you can see how it spreads. And what a pandemic means, David, actually is it's out in the community and everybody's at risk. That's what the word pandemic actually means. At the moment, it's not like that. It's contained to certain areas, like the north of Italy, as you mentioned, is one area where it's common. Iran, it's quite common. And, and, and South Korea, their are places to watch now, mind you, because, you know, the numbers are going up there. But a pandemic means it's really off the leash as it were and begins to spread more widely. And they haven't designated it a pandemic yet. It may become that. And uh, some of the experts are saying, watch this space, because it could turn into a pandemic in the end. But what's your sense? So if, if you go back to the history books, Luke, you, you, you know, you, you go back to, like they say, the flu virus of 1918, yeah, which yeah. at the end did for maybe between 50 and 100 million people around the world. I mean, is there... The, the level of panic that I'm seeing, I'm reading, I'm on Twitter, I'm watching the news, suggests that corona has this type of potential. What's your feeling as a scientist? It, it hasn't. That's the most important it hasn't. We know the type of people who are dying are people. In, the average age of death is 75. Uh, there are people who have had a heart attack or some kind of underlying disease, cancer. You know, lung disease has put you at risk because your body's weak. You know, the virus gets a foothold, runs rampant, and sadly and tragically then people will die. So the one in 1918 killed young people. It was different. It was killing people in their 20s, which is much more serious. And the reason for that, by the way, was when you're in your 20s, your immune system can be really strong, you know, and went into massive overdrive and sadly killed all those millions of people. So it was a different type of thing. And remember, different virus family again. So the comparison with 1918 wouldn't be that close with this one. Now, of course, they watched it closely. If it did begin to kill younger people, and it's not, by the way, then that becomes a concern. Oh, dear, this, this looks much more serious, you know, whereas older people are more vulnerable. Uh, the death rates are interesting. I know this sounds a bit morbid, but um, it's important. For, it's called epidemiology. It's the science of this, by the way. People make a living from looking at these numbers. If you're over 80, there's probably a 15% that you might die if you get it, you know. Nobody under nine has died zero death rate per age, for instance, you know. And as you get older then, the, the, the likelihood of dying goes up, you know. But mainly people, late 60s, 70s are the ones who are dying. 1918, different story. It was young people dying, you see. And all that traffic, remember after the First World War, it spread like wildfire all over the world, you know, very dangerous, you know. All that kind of thing made, made that particular virus especially troublesome. And in the end, David, that, that got burnt out because the people who survived had an immune response to it, remember. And the virus had nowhere to hide, you know. So, so, that's so, what, so, that's so what 1918 flu burnt out. Explain to me, as an immunologist, how does a, a, a virus burn itself out? Explain that to me. Yeah, so, so the virus goes into your body. It lives inside cells. Viruses are the worst type of parasite, by the way. They, they bring no benefits to us at all. They latch onto cells. In this case, in the case of the COVID one, uh, they latch onto lung cells. Uh, they, a, they've got a thing, you know, they're, they're called coronaviruses. They've got a spike all around them, like a crown, I suppose. At the tip of the spike, it binds this little piece of protein that locks onto a lung cell, like a key going into a lock, opens the door and goes inside the lung cell. And now it's inside the lung cell. And then guess what? It starts to divide. And now the question then is, can you mount an immune response? The analogy, David, I use is a bit like two unwanted guests arrive in your house, come inside, eat all the food in your fridge, and then go and have sex in your guest room you see, and start to procreate. Um, Don't worry, I've been there. I've, I've had many of those people in my house. We all have. Yeah, I know. Exactly. And then they leave without saying thank you. Now, the thing is, uh, when they leave, actually, it gets worse, though, but they leave a bomb behind and the cell dies. Isn't that terrible? So they damage the lungs. In this case, that the symptoms then begin. So viruses usually kill the cell they infect. They're, they're evil creatures in that way, you know. And of course, they kill the cell and they, they, they kill the cell and get out. You know, they escape the cell. So now they're outside. They jump into the next cell. They, they use their key, go into the neighbor's house and go in there, you know, and then, and, and then start dividing, you know. So this is how they work. Now, the, the good news is our immune system evolved over millions of years to fight the damn things, you know, and we can recognize them. And we have special sensors for the virus and they lock onto the virus. I don't like the guards, I suppose, arriving, if you like to to get rid of your own to guests. So the guards arrive and they get rid of the virus and now you get better. And that's how the immune system works. It's a wonderful thing. And, and my lab works on the initial phase of how you sense a virus. So they're the first centers in that process. And then very importantly, you make these wonderful molecules called antibodies. They're a bit like blue tack. They jam the key, if you like. 
and the key can't go in the lock anymore and the virus has nowhere to go. And lo and behold, you, you clear the virus from your system. That's in 80% of people that will happen now with the uh, with this particular virus, which is good news, you see. So that's how the immune system works, I guess. And remember, it's evolution. Uh, you know, the ones who survive have a good, good immune system that can fight the thing. And, and tell me, do you think we're close to having an antivirus from close to a vaccination? What's your sense as, yeah. as a scientist, as a doctor? Well, well, there's great news, actually. But first of all, if we, if, 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 the question is why do, you, why do you die? If the immune system works, you should clear it. If you're older, your immune system has been impaired because as we get old, all our bits go but wobbly, including the immune system. And that's why these older people sadly succumb. And strangely, that means the virus, where, where you have your, got your analogy, you have guests in your spare bedroom and suddenly there's a thousand of them in there because they've, they've multiplied massively, you see. And that drives the guards crazy. So, some really rough guards come out and they really beat up the whole system and you get really sick, you know, and you die of a melee, shall we say. Now, now the, thing it is, the thing is, the antiviral mechanisms might actually stop the virus dividing. And of course, in the case of AIDS, we've got great antiviral drugs that stop the virus dividing, and they work really well for HIV. As you know, that's a big success story for the, the drug industry. A second type of drug that works are anti-inflammatories, because your, your body goes into a massive inflamed state when there's too many viruses. And there are drugs, 80 drugs being trialed at the moment in China, some showing huge promise. One surprising one is a drug called chloroquine which was first found for malaria. Strangely. The Chinese, they would, began firing things at this to beat the band, kind of, you know, almost like randomly in a way, and come across chloroquine. That really slows down damage. So the prediction would be that the vaccine will take about nine months to a year, which is a bit of a distance away, I guess. But in the meantime, if you do get sick, your doctor can give you medicine to stop you dying. That, that's the real progress, I suppose, that we're all predicting. So, so in other words, the, the seriousness is beginning to to go away, but we still need to keep a very careful eye on it because it is still a very serious disease. And look, can I just ask you again, as a scientist, an immunologist, when you're watching the news and you're reading online, etc., and you see the panic that has been instilled by all sorts of radio shows and TV shows, etc., what kind of goes through your mind as a scientist? Yeah, your heart sinks, to be honest there. And I was in London myself and the headlines are shocking. You go, good God, I can't go on the underground. You know, this kind of thing, you know. And remember, there's only a handful of cases in the UK still. I think there's two deaths at the moment. And I'm not downplaying the seriousness of people dying, of course, because it's, it is a tragedy. But, but really, it's, it's, it's a case of the media kind of going into overdrive, I have to say. Now, on the other hand, it is a serious matter. So it's a question of balance. But this business of, of headlines and people panic buying face masks. And I was, I was in a taxi yesterday, actually, on my way to RTE. And the taxi driver said he went in to try and buy a, um, a hand sanitizer. The cheapest was nineteen ninety nine. He said, to hell with this, I'm not buying that, right? So instead, he bought some regular wipes and he put his aftershave into it. Very clever, you see. And the type of aftershave, he said, would kill anything. So <laughs> that, that, that was his response to it, you know. But this sort of panic thing, it's a terrible shame, isn't it? And then the other thing I, that, that worries me as a, as a scientist would be, there isn't much truth behind this fear at the moment moment you know there's a risk of course there is but it's tiny you know but then again remember we do need to be vigilant and be cautious and use common sense as the, as the main advice look can i just ask you though uh, obviously in terms of economics etc you know the key to minimizing and stopping the virus is, 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 is to quarantine areas that have it so that people can't travel etc so in a way you do have to shut down those areas where the virus is present, like, for example, the north, north of Italy and, and China, of course, and Iran and places where it's present, there is obviously a massive dislocation to try and get to the bottom of this. Yeah, no, you do. I mean, that, that, that's the, by, by the way, David, that was the medieval way of handling infections, remember, was quarantine. You know, you cordon people off, you lock them in their houses, you keep them on a ship in the harbour, you know, for 40 days. The word quarantine means 40 days. So this has been going on for hundreds of years as a mechanism to stop the thing, thing you see. And, you, and you're right. Like north of Italy, they've responded quite sensibly. They'll cancel big public events that make sense because people are mixing less, you know. Uh, schools do shut down is the next thing. This may come, remember. I mean, if this continues, the only way to stop it spreading might be to take these measures until, and then eventually it will go away. Or The good news is it just takes a bit of time, you know, and eventually it goes away. I think you're right, though. The, the bigger concern now is the economic impact, clearly. And there's lots of examples, as you know, of huge problems. And another example, actually, in London, I happened to meet a guy who has a brewery. He was a friend of mine who has a brewery, and he said all his orders have been cancelled in Italy and Spain because people aren't going out to the pubs anymore, you know? So the, I remember, I think a trillion dollars was knocked off the stock markets, wasn't it? Yeah, I mean, the, the stock markets, we're going to talk about this uh, later on. They're down 12% in a week, uh, you know, here in the States. And obviously the States, the lead for everything. And the, and, and the, the stocks that have been 
fall in are, you know, retail stocks, pubs and yeah. restaurants and airlines and, you know, anything where your average Joe, like all of us go out and socialize, is, is being hammered. But what your view is, the panic at the moment is worse than the reality. Absolutely. That, that's, that, that's, that, that's the exact point. Now, the problem would be if you in the World Health Organization or them, um, you're an expert. Um, often they will overstate it slightly because they're, they're more they're more happy. Some of them have been quoted as saying, "Look, I, I want to be overcautious here. I don't want to be accused of getting it wrong because yes. there's still a chance things might get bad." And, and they'll say things like, "You know, oh look, there's a risk and so on." And then the media puts the headline up. You see, so you can see why experts are sometimes overcautious. But certainly, um, the business of, of panic buying stuff is un- unjustified. Luke, listen, an absolute pleasure for clarifying that. John, have you any questions for Luke? Yeah, I do, yeah. There was just a couple of questions I have for you, Luke. So everything you've said there, were we right to cancel the Ireland-Italy game? We were for definite. That made sense because a huge crowd of people in a confined space that could spread in that crowd. See, the virus loves friends, remember. You know, so sure. if you have all those people standing around and they're all coughing and some of them are coughing, that would spread through that crowd. That was very sensible, really. Now, if those Italians arrive and went into different pubs all over Dublin, that's less of a risk because there's less people being exposed to the infected people then. So, so I wasn't justified to cancel their travel, you see, because they could still come to Dublin and just don't all hang out in the one place, I suppose. So the common, the common sense response was to cancel the match or for definite. Right, OK. And, and given the fact that this was a new virus... Can we expect more viruses to evolve yeah. over the next few years? I mean, is this going to be a, an ongoing thing from now on? Or Again, it's impossible to predict on the sense that they crop up though now and again, there's no doubt. And, and it's a bit random in a sense, you know. Now, remember, there are four of these coronaviruses in our community already at this. Right. And they cause the common cold, right? So you might have a cold right now and it could be a coronavirus, you see, a different member of the family. So they're, they're reasonably well understood. These, these family members, I guess. And, and this one's just a bit different. The chance of more of them cropping up, there's always a risk. Bat, they live in bats, would you believe? I mean, bats, coronaviruses love bats for some reason. There's up to 500 <laughs> different, different types in a bat. You know, can you believe it? And the bats are quite healthy, by the way, as far as we can tell. Right. And, they can jump in, and they can jump into humans. The other good news about this one is its mutation rate is quite slow. Whereas something like HIV mutates very fast. Influenza itself is a fast, faster mutator than this one. And that's a good thing because that means once you get an immune response to it, you'll be protected for a long time because it won't change then. You know? and, but the good news is you know, we're learning so much. Every second almost, you wouldn't believe it, because I'm watching this constantly, as you might imagine, new discoveries are being made about this virus. And, and the speed at which the development of the vaccine is unprecedented. They'll have it by September, optimistically. Three or four years ago, it would have taken five years to get a vaccine. Do you know what I mean? Right. So yeah. the, technolo- the, te- the technologies improve massively. Uh, and, and interestingly as well, David, the Norwegian government have funded this hugely, by the way. The Norwegians, with all their wealth, decided to fund, fund global health issues. And they put huge amounts of money into vaccine development, you see. So, so when the vaccine does arrive, uh, the Norwegians should get some credit for helping to put money into it. Can I just ask you one more question? How does a virus jump from a bat into a bloke? Yes, well, now there's an, uh, the usual conspiracy theories. There. But remember, the other big one is that it was made in some lab somewhere. Have you, seen, have you heard this one? There was an evil scientist. Oh, there's loads That's of great true. conspiracy theories flying around the place. Yeah, by the way, them. John loves those fucking conspiracy theories. They, they're not true, those theories, by the way. Uh, it, they could trace it back to a bat, basically. The other creature was a pangolin, strangely, the spiny anteater. They found some of the virus on that creature as well. So the question is, how does it get out? Well, it can cough just like a human, you know? That's the first thing. Uh, if, it's, if it's obviously a dead bat, it must be some of the tissue is, still has some live virus in it. So it's probably fl- fluids, fluids in the bat somehow got out and got, got sad, sad, sadly got into a human being. That's probably the main way it jumped anyway from one speech to another. Extraordinary. Listen, Luke, thanks a million for that. It was really interesting. Thanks, yeah, Luke. Thanks, John. Bye. Yeah, all the best, Bye. David. Thanks. By the way, just before we start, Sunday, March 15th is the live show. John and I on the stage of the Olympia. Sunday, March 15th. Get your tickets at ticketmaster.ie. God, that was brilliant. That was a great insight from, from Luke there. Fascinating stuff, isn't it? Yeah, he's, he's, he's a really brilliant explainer of, of science, you know, and I think he's, uh, he's one of the great, uh, the great assets that people don't hear enough about in Ireland. He's a really, really interesting yeah. guy. But obviously, you know, we, we were talking there about the economy at the end and he was, you know, making the point that it's basically what's going to happen to the economy now. It's funny, John, being in New York uh, because of the obsession with the stock markets, the stock markets were down 12% 
this week. It's, okay. But it really kind of highlights the the fickleness of the financial markets. And, and it, it just struck me this week in particular that why we put so much trust and faith in the stock markets, given that it's, you know, our financial security in the future. It seems bonkers to me. Well, it's a, it's a really interesting point. In actual fact, you know, if you take out the United States where they have this thing called 401k, which is the way in which Americans invest their pensions, so reasonably well-off yeah. Americans invest in the stock market, if you take that cohort of Americans out of the equation, the stock market probably affects about 2% of the global population. So as a an idea that we should be worried about, it's entirely inconsequential in terms of the global economy. Also, I think that in the beginning, stock markets were a way in which companies could raise money from the public. If you think about it, that was its original uh, idea. So you'd float yeah. a company, you'd raise money from the public, and therefore the way in which the stock market gyrated around had some implication uh, or some at least validity for the underlying value of the stocks and therefore that it linked to the economy, etc. So there was a direct link. Now with electronic trading and a huge amount of leverage in the system, I'm not so sure it's anything other than the kind of canary in the coal mine, the thing that shrieks if there's a perception that the global economy is going up or down. I'm not sure it's really a significant leading indicator. But what I want to talk about, John, is really interesting. Remember what Luke was saying there, which is that certain people are fragile and susceptible to a virus. And he identified older yeah. people, people with bronchitis, people with any sort of underlying fragility. I think we could yeah. actually look at the stock markets in the same way, is that the stock markets are fragile to events when they are overvalued, when they are at the end of a long, long upward cycle, when there is a perception that the next move is going to be downwards. Okay, and I'll explain that because it is really interesting. It's what I find interesting about pandemics and the panic in pandemics. It's the same type of psychological response that you see in stock markets when they turn, either on the up or the down. So yeah, stock yeah. markets are very, very susceptible to panic and more susceptible to panic when they are at the very end of a long phase. So if you actually take the life cycle of the human that Luke was talking about, that we're more susceptible to diseases as we get older. Stock markets are more susceptible to panic as the rally gets older. So we are yeah. now in the 10th or 11th year of a long bull market, a long upswing. And at that, that stage, because we're at the 10th or 11th year, the market itself is susceptible. And I'll explain it. There's a great way of thinking about stock markets. There's two economists who really, John, understood stock markets. One was a guy called yeah. Minsky and one was a guy called Kindleberger. And they were both writing at around the same time in the 1940s, 1950s in the United States and 1960s. Neither of them incredibly well known in their time but now it's becoming obvious that they were really brilliant, brilliant understanders of that link between psychology, human behavior, and stock markets. And if anybody's interested, Kindleberger's book, which is actually called Manias, Bubbles, and Panics, is a real gem if you're actually interested. So is, is this along the same lines as... as um you know, Dan Ariely and behavioral economics, it's, you know. It's, it's interesting. It was, it was before, it was kind of behavioral economics before behavioral economics, if you know what I mean. Before, yeah. they just, they were just studiers. These were two guys who studied stock markets and human behavior and how it all interlinked. They never called it behavioral economics because neither of them were psychologists. They were both economists. But yeah. for me, they, 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 they really understand how the market works. Now, both of them arrived at a similar conclusion, and I'll just lay it out for you, right? Sure. It's called the Minsky cycle. A guy called Hyman Minsky, unusual geezer, unusual geezer. But do you remember Paul McCulley, our old mate? I do. Paul McCulley was Pinco. my... Yeah, so Paul McCulley was my boss at UBS years ago. He then ended up being the chief economist of PIMCO, the largest bond fund in the world. And I learned huge amounts from Paul. And he was a disciple of Minsky. And he always said to me, look, learn this stuff it'll allow you to understand how stock markets work. So Minsky and Kindleberger came up with this idea, but it's been attributed more to Minsky now. It's the idea that stock markets and all markets, whether it's housing markets, stock markets, commodity markets, oil markets, gold, la, 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 
they go through what Minsky called six different phases, right? So an economic, a business cycle and a financial cycle will go through six stages, right? So the first stage is what Minsky called displacement. And that's when something real happens in the economy, which actually changes the undervalue, the underlying value of the stock market. So for example, it could be like a large cut in interest rates, right? So if you take the beginning of this cycle, which started after the 2008 crash. So the 2008 crash, all the markets crash, central banks react to the crash by reducing interest rates to zero. So that's what Minsky would call displacement. That's a real event that totally realigns and basically resets the dial. And that attracts people back into the stock market, right? Then the second phase, he said, was the stocks start to rise. They start to rise in the displacement phase. They begin to start rising again. Once stocks start to rise, what happens is people start, and particularly banks or financial institutions, start lending again to people in order to buy stocks. So that's called gearing. So the second stage is gearing, right? And as gearing comes in, money goes into the stock market, stocks continue to rise. Then the third phase, which Minsky called was euphoria, where basically everybody believes that everything is back on track again. And what happens is there's a, there's a sort of a feedback loop into the economy itself. So once the gearing stays, phase starts, people start to feel more confident. They start to borrow again. They go into the market. The price of the assets keeps going up. They begin to start feeling euphoric. And, and, and that's one of the great adages is that the economy begins to feel better. Uh, and one of the great lines is always that uh, sometimes the worst investment decisions are taken in the best of times. So when th- things feel right. really good. So the third phase is, is euphoria. Then we get into the fourth phase is the sort of bubble or the mania phase where everybody wants to get involved. And this is the one, you know, the one we said that nothing so undermines your financial judgment as the sight of your neighbor getting rich phase, right? So yeah, basically JP everybody Morgan. else is in it. And that's what happened in this, the housing market in Ireland, you know, in 2006, 2007 or 2005. You know, everybody gets in, everyone's talking about it. It's the bubble phase. It's the fourth phase, Right. Now think about yeah. we're trying to we're trying to talk about the coronavirus now, right? Now in the bubble phase, people feel they're very rich, but in actual fact, what they are is they're highly indebted. So everybody's borrowing, the market's going up, everyone's borrowing and buying on what's called margin, on margin. So you borrow yeah. in order to buy these assets, right? This, while it seems that the market is incredibly euphoric. It's also when the market is at its most risky, right? Because assets are incredibly, incredibly expensive. So if you think last week, the Dow was close to 30,000. It's fallen 12% in the last week, but it was moving towards 30,000, right? Right. Incredibly expensive stocks, right? What's called the P-E ratio, John, which is the ratio of price to earnings, has never been higher. So therefore, what the stock market was building in at this euphoric bubble stage is it was actually pricing in just blue skies for the next five or six years. There's going to be no recession. There's going to be no problem with the bond market. There's going to be no problem with politics, all that sort of stuff. It's priced for the best times. That's when markets are at their most vulnerable. And that, like humans, tends to happen when the the recovery is very mature. So it's been going on for five, six, seven, eight, nine years. So you have nine yeah. years, 10 years of a bull market. People begin to forget what actually happened. Then Minsky talks about this, the bubble stage. Then he says the next stage is the distress stage. And that's when savvy investors start to get out. They think, hold on a second, this is far too expensive. I'm going to get out. But usually it's the very smart guys get out first, leaving the herd to continue to talk through CNN and through all these NBC money programs, all that sort of stuff you see on TV, which is basically only yeah. the, the gobshites, right? That's gobshite television, right? And, <laughs> right. you know, it is it's complete gobshite television. So the distress phase should be governed by the adage, right? That nobody ever lost money by taking a profit, which is the truth, right? So if you yeah. own okay. something and it's really expensive and you've made a few quid, take it off the table because... You never lose money by selling too early. When you actually lose money is when you try to sell and there's no buyers. And that's the sixth stage, which is called the panic stage, right? That basically everybody sees the smart guys selling, think, oh shit, we better get out too. 
Everybody gets out at the same time. Everybody panics and they go to sell and there's no buyers, right? The best time to sell anything is when there's loads of buyers and you're the only seller. The worst time to try to sell anything is when there's no buyers and everybody else is trying to sell. So what Minsky does is he gives us these six phases, right? So displacement, gearing, euphoria, mania stroke bubble, distress, and then the final phase is panic. Now, imagine okay, that as the... Yeah. Let's just take that back to the coronavirus now. Yeah. How is that relating to the coronavirus? So the coronavirus strikes when the market is at its most overvalued, when we're in the mania bubble phase. And that's when the market is at its most fragile. So had the coronavirus struck in the displacement phase, as in back in 2011, 2012, because the market yeah. wasn't so vulnerable and wasn't so fragile and wasn't the valuations weren't so extended, the market might have fallen a percent or two. But it falls by 10% as it did last week or 12% when everybody's valuations are really stretched, when people are highly leveraged, when the market is highly geared and when panic is susceptible on the downside. In the displacement stage, in the early stages, panic is usually only on the upside. So people become euphoric, right? Now people become nervous. And it's that idea, John, of greed and fear, greed and fear, greed and fear, right? When the market right. it gets greedy, stocks go up. When the market becomes fearful, stocks plummet. The market becomes incredibly fearful when everybody is leveraged and has borrowed to actually chase the market up. So it strikes me that the coronavirus comes right at the stage when the market is fragile. Now think about it in the context of humans. Luke was saying it is only deadly when you are very old and very fragile. It is yeah. also only deadly as a financial issue when the recovery is very old and very fragile. And that's exactly where we are now. So there is a sort of a symmetry between the panic yeah, in the market. Yeah, the between panic in the market, the age of the recovery, the age of the bull market, and the stretched valuations. So that's, I think, why you're seeing such a dramatic downward lurch in financial markets. Because if you take the Minsky cycle, we're at the very late stage of the cycle. And in the same ways, if you take people's own life cycle, you become vulnerable as you get older when your actual body its immune system is also is quite weak. So in, in a way, the financial market's immune system is very weak at the moment. So, so Mark, just talking about Minsky there for a second. So if there are these six stages and very defined stages, then are they not predictable? Um, and they, they are predictable. I, so why do we keep making the same mistake? Because human nature is amazing. People say they learn from their mistakes, but we don't. This is the interesting thing. I think it's because humans psychologically are hardwired for optimism. This is why most of us get out of bed in the morning. You know, we actually, in the back of our head, we figure out that, you know, I don't know, maybe tomorrow is going to be better than today or today is going to be better yeah. than yesterday. So I think there is a, a human weakness for optimism. For this time it's different. It won't happen to me. It's also the human weakness for the herd, for getting excited at the same time as the yeah. herd. It's also the human weakness for gossip and thinking, you know, oh my God, he bought that for a tenner. It's now worth a million quid. I better get in and buy five of those, right? So all those things we see time and time and time and time again, you know? And I can bring this all the way back, John, to, you know, I remember we were talking, I remember, I think I might have told you years ago about Joseph and his amazing Technicolor dream coach. Do you remember that? <laughs> From the 1970s? Yeah, it's great musical. Great musical, right? Because I knew you'd like that, right? But that was about the Pharaoh and Joseph, right? Do you remember that, that, that thing? The Pharaoh wakes up in the middle of the night and he has a dream and he sees seven years of plenty followed by seven years of famine. Do you remember that? Yeah. Well, I do, right? yeah. yeah, I do. Well, that was nothing more than the economic cycle back then. Like, so the Pharaoh comes to Joseph and says, man, what's this all about? And Joseph was like the first finance minister. He says, man, this is about the economic cycle. We've had seven years of plenty, right? If I were you, I'd be putting some stuff away, putting grain away, feeding up the cattle, etc., because we might go into seven years of a downswing. And what he was basically saying, this is based on agricultural yields, that in actual fact, in the ancient world, if you overproduce and you overproduce on the same nutrient basis, you'll actually incur a famine. So it's the same idea, cycles in agriculture, cycles in economics, all go back to these seven-year cycles. You go up, everything's great, then you go down again, up again, down again. 
What is difficult, John, is to get the timing right of all these. That's the key. Yeah. So they always right. behave the same way, but it's impossible to get the timing right. And that's the difference between really good investors and really bad investors. Really good investors have a nose for timing. And I always thought that the role of the economist is not to get the timing right, but is to actually get the story right. Because the economist is there to try to pre prepare people for the eventuality rather than make money per se out of these forecasts. If you can do that, that's great. But so you are right. So it's actually identifying what stage of the Minsky cycle you're in. You're absolutely right. So if you are an investor, right, you've got a world view, you get all the same invest information as everybody else. You say, okay, are we in the displacement phase? Are we still in the gearing phase? Are we in the euphoria phase? Are we in the fourth phase, the bubble phase? Or do I think we're actually in the fifth phase of distress? And if we are in distress, maybe I should get out now because the last thing I want to be doing is in the panic stage, rushing from the door when everybody else is rushing from the door as well and nobody can get out. Yeah. So you're absolutely right. So if you are an investor, the key thing is keep this framework in the back of your head and then identify where you believe you are. And if right. you believe you're at distress, then it's time to go. Right. That's a really interesting way of putting it, actually, and, and very understandable. So tell me this then, is this going to be another correction of the markets? I keep hearing that that phrase being bandied about in the same way as back in 2008, there was a, a correction of the markets back then. So there's another type of correction. It's just brought on by something entirely different. The difference is, right, the difference is now there's two types of shocks that can happen to an economy, traditionally, John. One is a demand shock and one is a supply shock, right? So a demand shock is what happened in 2008, right? So the housing market falls, banks go bust, demand in the economy evaporates. So the central yeah. bank comes in, identifies it's a demand problem, injects money into the system to try and boost demand. And what they did there was, it was called a balance sheet recession, John. So basically the balance sheet of the middle classes around the world went bust. And the, the very easy way to see this is, is imagine what happened in Ireland, right? The Irish balance sheet had loads, on the asset side had loads of houses, and on the liability side had loads of debt. When house prices began to fall, the assets that people thought they had collapsed in value. But on the other side of the balance sheet, the debt, which they took out in order to buy those assets, didn't fall in tandem. It actually went up because interest yep. rates were a little bit positive. So what you get is a balance sheet recession, which is very, very deep, very protracted, and affects broadly the middle classes, and then that filters down into other classes, right? That's what happened in 2008. A demand shock can be fixed if you increase demand, if the government increases demand, i.e. by building roads and hospitals and bridges and all that sort of stuff, and they cut interest rates to boost demand. A supply shock, which is now what we're experiencing with the coronavirus, is much more tricky. And the reason is the supply shock is what actually happened in the 1970s, where the oil price rises, production falls, and you end up having a problem on the production side of the economy, on the supply side. This is what the coronavirus, its impact on supply chains will have. Because if you think, for example, yesterday, Japan closed all its schools until April, right? Mm. If you a country like Japan starts going to shut down, if a country like China goes into shutdown, what you have is a supply shock. You can't fix that with interest rates. Only thing that fixes that is time. And obviously, one thing you run out of in a crisis is time, okay? That's what disappears in a crisis. Yeah. The only thing that can actually fix a supply shock is you allow this thing to go through the motions itself. And that means that the global economy could, in the extreme case, shut down for a number of weeks or months. Now, given that there's so much debt in the economy, that will have a profound in fact, impact. And that's what financial markets are worried about, even though they don't articulate it as coherently as this. Certainly, it seems like they're saying that it's clearing up in China and new cases of coronavirus are, are dropping. So it seems to be burning itself out, as, as Luke said, the phrase he used. But actually, what I found really interesting is, outside of China, the two major areas that were contaminated most was Italy, northern Italy, which is a bizarre one, but also Iran. And I was thinking that, is that kind of indicative of their relationship between the two countries? I think it's a fascinating question, because in Italy, you can put it down to maybe two things. One is that Italians are wealthy and they travel a lot. 
And two, the Italian population is really quite old. Italy is the second oldest country in Europe after Germany. Okay, right. Yeah. So, so it's going to have, if, if you get a virus taking hold, it's going to be more virulent, as Luke was saying, in the older population. So that's, the, that's quite interesting. But come back to the China, the, the Iran thing, right? Iran has been isolated by the West since 1979, since the Iranian Revolution. And the Chinese have identified this, have identified Iran as the oldest civilization in the, in the region. It's going to be around for a long time. It's been around for a long time. It ain't going anywhere. Yeah. And China has identified Iran as a significant ally in the region. And the way in which China manifests this is through this, you know, this idea of the Belt and Road Initiative, John, the, that China yeah. is building this huge amount of infrastructure, train and road infrastructure from China all the way through to Turkey. And so you yeah. get and co- going through the stands and going through the Pakistan and the stands, then into Iran, then into Turkey, uh, etc. So if you can imagine the, the part of the world that Alexander the Great went to, okay, imagine that in the back of your head. Mm-hmm. Marco Polo, yeah. Alexander the Great, these sort of great adventures. That Silk Road, the old Silk Road, uh, is where China has identified. And obviously central to that is Iran. So what are the Chinese doing? They're building huge infrastructural projects in Iran. And this right, might okay. explain the extraordinary incident of coronavirus in Iran because their ties with China are very, very close. Why? Because the United States, of course, as I'm sitting in New York, has had sanctions on Iran for years. So there's no connection between Iran and the West in any material way, but there's a massive connection between China and Iran in an actual material way. That may well be the answer to your question, which is Chinese companies and Iranian companies are working together. Chinese and Iranians are trading together. Why? Because the West will not trade with Iran, so Iran has to trade with China. And that may well be the the answer. Right. I thought it might have something to do with the sanctions on Lemsip in Iran. (laughs) (laughs) So, John, just to conclude, as I am about a couple of blocks from Wall Street, and let's conclude in the coronavirus and the market, the framework to look at everything is this Minsky idea, to identify where you are in the cycle. And the difference between good investors and bad investors is good investors always get their timing right, which is why Warren Buffett said, be greedy when everybody else is fearful and be fearful when everybody else is greedy. So if you take Warren Buffett's view and he's the best investor in the world, the timing is all about identifying where the herd is, where the rest of the guys are and thinking, do you know what? Do I want to be in the middle of that herd when things are fragile? Or do I want to be at my own? Now, the interesting thing is that's called value investing, John. It's the difference between looking at valuations and the other thing is called momentum investing, where you actually just go with the crowd. And at pivotal moments, pivotal moments, and this could be one of them, the value investor takes his chips off the table and is happy to go for a drink, chill out and watch the rest of them panic when the panic sets in. Just before we go, a big shout out for the Olympia, which is now on Sunday week, the 15th of March. John, myself and guests on the Olympia stage. We'd love to see you there. Tickets at ticketmaster.ie. Talk to you all shortly.